Chapter 10 Halleck listened to his agent rather unhappily. Felix Yeager had been to the Red Rose and had been seen in the company of the girl Sasha, an associate of his late and unlamented henchman, Sergei and Olaf. He glanced around his richly furnished chambers, rose from the cushioned seat, and went on to the door. He opened it and checked to make sure that no one was listening. In the palace, you could never be too certain. There were servants everywhere. Normally, he would have never agreed to meet his underling in his own quarters. But the man had claimed the matter was urgent, and he was someone whose judgment Halleck had learned to trust. What could the girl have told Jaeger? Nothing too incriminating, he was certain. She had never seen his face, and he had never let those two assassins know who he really was. No, he was in no danger. Of that he was certain. He rose and picked up a small ebony statuette, an exotic carving made in Araby, or one of those other hot southern lands. He was certain his brother would know. It was the kind of scholarship in which he excelled. His hand tightened around the figurine with such power that he almost broke it. Control yourself, he told himself. It was bad form to show any tension in front of a lackey, something he would never normally do. It was a sign of the pressure he was under. His superiors, those who had progressed further in the hidden order than he did, were holding him responsible for the continued existence of Gotrek Gurnison and Felix Jaeger. And it didn't help that the two of them had been instrumental in foiling the poisoning of the grain stores. The pressure to do something about them was really on him now. Halleck shook his head. Wishing for the hundredth time, he had never accepted that first invitation to study secret alchemical lore. Not that that mattered now. Soon the city would fall anyway. He took a deep breath to calm himself and fought to get his whirling thoughts under control. Even though he knew he was going to be on the winning side, the wait for victory was proving to be an enormous strain. He wished the waiting was over and the city fallen already. Only a matter of time, he told himself. He forced his resentment-filled thoughts back to the matter at hand, on the business with the bar girl. She was of no account. She could not harm him. Maybe it would be best just to let the matter slide. That was most likely the best course. Certainly, it would have been the one he would normally have favored. But now, with the effects of the hidden mutation working on him, and the stress of all the waiting, and the constant feeling that he was betraying someone no matter what he did, he felt the need to do something. After all, why take any chances? Quickly, decisively, he gave his agent instructions. It would maybe be for the best if the girl quietly disappeared. He was sorry about her death, but he tried telling himself that he was being merciful. She would likely be dead in the next few days anyway. The white boar was quiet. Everyone was moody and tense. The events of the past couple of days had unsettled all of them. Ghosts, dark magic, and rumors of treacherous poisoning of the granaries had done nothing to improve a level of morale already undermined by plague and the size of the besieging army. Felix glanced around, wondering where Ulrika was. She had been strangely distant recently. He was starting to think that even their fights were better than this growing estrangement. At least, part of him was. Another part of him felt a growing sense of relief, even freedom. He wondered where Uli, Bjorni, and Snorri were. Most likely at the Red Rose again. Bjorni was certainly proving to be a bad influence on young Uli, dragging him along to the Joy House every night. But it wasn't like he was holding a dagger at a younger slayer's throat. Felix looked down into the goblet of wine, swirled the red liquid around and took a sip. He was definitely too tense this evening, he told himself and then smiled sourly. Under these circumstances, it was hardly surprising. Assassins were looking for him. He was in a haunted, plague-ridden city under siege by a demonic army. And he and his companions had insulted many of their fellow citizens, including some nasty witch hunters. It was only natural to be tense. He tried to tell himself he had been in tighter corners, but it did not do much good. He looked over at Gotrek. 
The Slayer was glaring morosely into his own ale. He looked around as if daring any of the other customers to look at him the wrong way. No one, not even the White Wolf Templars, were foolish enough to do that. No need to look for a fight, said Felix. There will be plenty of that tomorrow. I most likely, Manling, said Gotrek. And no doubt you will have a chance to find your doom. There is that, Manling. You don't sound too pleased. It galls me. Felix was shocked. Was the Slayer actually having second thoughts about seeking a heroic doom? What goals you? That the forces of chaos might conquer this place. That they might win. What does that matter to you? It is death you seek. Aye, it is. But a meaningful death. Not falling anonymously in some great ruckus. Somehow I doubt that will be your fate. We shall see. Maybe you will get a chance to challenge one of the leaders of the Horde. That would be a mighty doom. Gotrek looked up, as if whether to see Felix was mocking him. And at that moment, the door to the white boar opened, and Snorri and Uli hurried in. They came right over to the table. Best get over to the Red Rose, bellowed Uli. Snorri thinks there's something you might want to see. Amazing, thought Gracier Fankuol, staring up at the sky. So much power, so much magic. The clouds were red, not with the sort of ruddiness he had seen before when the sun was setting, but a bloody red, in which swirled vortexes of pure mystical energy, and around which bolts of lightning flickered without even discharging themselves to the earth. The sun was pleasantly obscured, the snow gleamed bloodily. Fankwell's weariness evaporated as he surveyed the battlefield. Another great victory, he told himself. A force nearly a quarter the size of our own annihilated with only a few hundred casualties to show for it. It was another testimony to his military genius. He could tell even Isaac Grottle was impressed, although he muttered sourly about their foes already having been exhausted by an earlier battle. As if that made any difference. Fankuel readily conceded that their enemies had already seen battle. It was merely another testament to his tactical skill, that he had chosen such a moment to strike. Grottle might claim it was simple luck, but Fankuel knew that all the great commanders made their luck. So, what if the Chaos worshippers had been harried by a few Kislevite horse soldiers? This in no way detracted from the magnitude of Fankuel's own victory. Sweeter still was the feeling that his power was growing, as this red storm from the north also grew. Using magic had come easier to him than ever before, and he had barely needed any intake of powdered warpstone to cast even the mightiest spells. It seemed like the horn rat was favoring him once again. And about time too, a deeply buried part of him fought. If only Felix Jaeger and Gotrek Gurdison were put before him at this moment, he felt certain he could dispatch both of them with ease. How sweet that would be. He fought off a feeling almost like a drunkenness. He was giddy with so much power in the air. The winds of magic were blowing stronger than ever he had felt them. More sleep glowed so brightly, its green light was visible even through the ruddy clouds. Magic flowed into his fur and into his veins. Truly this was a fine time to be alive, Fankwell thought. He gave orders to his army to hurry south, confident he would be able to deal with any threat they might encounter. Behind him, Isaac Rottle groaned and wheezed, as he gave the instructions to follow the Gracier's orders. Just at that moment, Fankwell stood dumbfounded, sensing an awesome gathering of power to the south. Suddenly, he wanted to bury himself deep below the ground, and not come out until he was certain whatever that was had passed. Since he couldn't do that, he decided the best course of action was a tactical withdrawal away from it. He began to give the orders, but Grottel countermanded him. I was told to say it to Skaven Blight, and that is what I intend to do. Fankwell almost blasted him then and there, 
but restrained himself from unleashing his righteous wrath. It was time to preserve power, in case he needed to make a quick escape. Max Schreiber gazed out from the tower. Soon the attack would come. It was obvious. As the sun set amid the eerie red clouds, a strange mist gathered over the battlefield. It was almost the same color as the clouds, and charged with the same evil power. Max could see the lines of force swirling around it, and knew that a spell of awesome potency was being prepared. Even with his own newfound confidence in his powers, Max knew he didn't want to meet whoever was casting that. The amount of power being gathered would need almost godlike strength to control, even with the backing of a hundred acolytes. Max wanted there were something he could do to disrupt it, but there was nothing he could think of. Even if he had all the mages in his own college behind him, he doubted there would have been anything he could do. He turned to Ulrika. They had grown closer in the past few days. She was grateful to him for saving her life, but he sent something more. He pushed the thought away, knowing it was far more likely his own hope speaking than anything real. He gave a sour smile, thinking it was easier for men to comprehend the mysteries of potent magic than to see into the human heart. Why do you smile? Ulrika asked pleasantly. You most likely don't want to know, Max replied. He was embarrassed. Most of his life had been spent in study and in advising people on how to protect themselves against evil magic. It was not something that prepared him for dealing with a woman like Ulrika. I would not have asked if I didn't want to know. Max scratched his lengthening beard to cover his embarrassment. Sometimes she was disconcertingly literally minded. I... I am just happy to be here with you, he ventured. Even under circumstances such as this. It was her turn to fall silent. She glanced away, looking over the glittering rooftops of Prague, instead of at a gathering chaos horde. By the light of the setting sun, seen from the height of the wall, it was magical. A wide expanse of red-tiled roofs and whitewashed walls from which rose bell towers, onion domes, and the gilded spires of the temples. Even the frosting of snow contributed to the beauty. Max walked over to her and laid his hand on her fur-covered shoulder. She didn't flinch, but she didn't look at him either. Are you happy? he asked. I don't know, she said. I am confused. About what? About lots of things. About you and Felix? Yes, among other things. Is there anything I can do to help? She slipped out of his grasp and walked over to the edge of the battlements once more. She leaned forward, putting her weight on the parapet, and glanced out towards the enemy. The massive war machines, high as towers, carved like statues, shimmered in the gloom. Along their sides, eerie red runes were springing into life, their bale fires reflecting in the snow beneath them. They drew the eye naturally, such was their power. They seemed like statues of evil gods. The small figures moving around their bases seem more like insects than actual men. Felix told me that in the waste there are huge statues of the Lords of Chaos, she said. They must resemble those machines, don't you think? It is possible, he said noncommittally, a little hurt that she had avoided the question. But I think what he saw really were statues. Those things are machines of metal and sorcery. Sorcery? Demons are being bound into them to give them power. Soon, I fear, they will spring into life. And then? And then they will roll over these walls and crush everything in their path. Is there nothing we can do? We can pray. Do you recognize him? asked Bjorni, gesturing to the unconscious man. To his surprise, Felix actually did. He knew he had seen that face before somewhere. He just couldn't recall where. The large bruise on his face might have something to do with that. He is somewhat familiar, Felix said, leaning over and clasping the man's chin, and then moving his face from side to side to get a better view. 
The man's hair was long and had flopped down into his face. His clothes were those of a nobleman, the fabric good, and the cut expensive. Felix had seen enough of these in his father's storehouses to know. He looked very out of place here, in this room of the Red Rose. What kind of company have you been keeping, young Felix? Bjorni asked with a leer. He put his heavily muscled arm around the shivering figure of the girl, Sasha, and with surprising gentleness wiped away the tears from her face. Felix looked at the half-naked slayer and the racks of whips and chains on the walls and wondered if what he suspected about Bjorni and Sasha could possibly be true. Nasty company, Gotrek said, leaning over and picking up the dagger which had fallen near the man's hands. He sniffed at it and then thrust the blade into Felix's general direction. Felix could see a greenish paste crusting the sharpened steel. I am willing to bet that is the same poison that was on Sergei's and Olaf's blades, he said. I think that is a bet you would win, Godric said. What happened here? Felix asked, looking at Bjorni and then at Sasha. They were both in a state of considerable undress. The girl's bodice had been hastily pinned closed. She wore only the scantiest of nightshirts. Bjorni was only clad in his breeches. His boots and weapons lay close to the bed. Well, I thought maybe you hadn't gone about your questioning the right way, young Felix, so I thought I would interrogate Sasha here in my own way. And then that would be what the leather cords and the chains were for, said Felix, gesturing to the pile of mechanisms close to the bed. Bjorni looked up at the ceiling and then nodded. Aye, something like that. Anyway, just as we were getting down to business, there was a disturbance outside the door, and some men came in. They were armed, and they obviously meant to do harm. And you stopped them? I threw a sheet over a pair of them, and then headbutted another in the Nadja's, said Bjorni with some satisfaction. They obviously were not expecting much resistance, and I think they panicked when they heard Snorri and Uli coming. So they started to run. I brained this one with the lampstand. Funny thing is, none of the bouncers came to investigate the noise, and you could hear the commotion all the way down the corridor, bellowed Uli. His face was red, and he looked very embarrassed for some reason. They were paid off, obviously, Godric said. Such would be my guess, Felix said. Did you know any of these men? He asked the girl. They weren't customers here, she said. If that's what you mean. Felix shrugged and looked at the unconscious man once again, thinking it was about time they woke him up. The only question was whether to hand him over to the authorities or leave him to the tender mercies of the slayers. Under these circumstances, he felt they didn't have much choice. He would much rather they did this interrogation themselves. He wasn't certain what might happen if they handed this would-be killer to the guards. Even as the thought crossed his mind, Felix suddenly realized where he had seen this man before. On the first day of the siege, at the gate of gargoyles, he was one of the young men riding with the duke's brother, Willem. Wonderful, thought Felix, wondering exactly how far this corruption reached. Just then, the man groaned and began to stir. He looked up and turned pale as he glanced into the nastily grinning faces of the slayers. Tell me, said Felix, does Willem know you're here? The man's response surprised Felix. He will kill me if he finds out. It is us you should worry about, Godric said, raising his axe menacingly. Halleck paced backwards and forwards across the thick Arabian carpets of his chambers. All around him, he could hear the sounds of the palace. He strode over to the window, pulled the thick brocade hanging aside, and glanced out through the heavy leaded glass. A rim of snow clutched the window frame. Far below, he could see clean across the square of heroes to the Temple of Ulrich. Thinking about what happened to heretics in that place, if they were caught, made him more nervous still. Being handed over to the tender mercies of the Templars of Ulrich was not a prospect to make anyone cheerful. He cursed Jan Pavelovich bitterly. 
If ever you find your way back into my hands, I will make you pay for this, you blundering fool. He turned away from the window, and strode over to his bookshelves, took down the copy of The Deed of Magnus he had poured over as a boy, and told himself to remain calm. It was not the fault of Jan Pavlovich. Who could have guessed that one of those accursed slayers could have been present during the attack? and could have fought off four armed men equipped only with improvised weapons. No, these things happened. Sometimes the fates were unkind, or maybe the old gods of Kislev conspired to undo his work. It was no use blaming Jan Pavlovich. The youth had served loyally and well for many seasons, ever since Halek had inducted him into the cult of the Changer of Ways. He was dedicated to the great cause, it was not his fault he had been left behind when the others fled. It was much more likely the fault of the other fools, the ones who had left him to the slayer. The words on the page were a blur. This was getting him nowhere. It didn't matter who was to blame. The damage was done. The only question was how much Jan Pavlovich had told them. Halek cursed the day he had ever been so foolish as to let the young man know his true identity. Maybe it would not matter so much. It would be only the word of Jan and his accusers against Halek's own. He was a man of great influence at the court. He could most likely face down any kind of accusation. Unless the Templars were called in, or someone demanded to examine him for the stigmata of chaos. Or maybe one of those wizards, like Max Schreiber, might be able to incriminate him with a spell. That would not be good. What could he do? The great plan was so near completion now. Soon the city would fall. If only he could last until then, he would be certain of his reward. He could flee the palace and find a hiding place among his brothers, until the great day dawned. Or could he? He had failed to see to the deaths of Gotrick Gurnison and Felix Jaeger. Maybe the hidden masters of the cult would punish him for that. After all, they had their reasons for wanting those dead, and he hadn't managed to do it. And trusting himself to the tender mercies of the likes of Victor or Damien was not a prospect he enjoyed either. They might find it all too tempting to do away with a potential rival under these circumstances. And then there was his own plan to contribute to the ultimate victory. At the height of the coming attack, he wanted to open one of the postern gates to the Chaos Horde. He had the authority and the means to do that. It was an act that would win him great favor in the eyes of change. Did he really want to give that up? Did he really have any choice? Things didn't seem quite as rosy as they had when he arose from bed this morning. Don't panic, he told himself. Think, you will find a solution. Suddenly, a way to redeem himself struck him. It was a solution so simple and yet so perfect, he was surprised he hadn't dared think about it before. He shook his head. He knew why. This was a throw of the dice by a desperate man, and he had never been this desperate before. And he had never really wanted to kill his own brother either.